good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the advice. So um, this, um, we're really excited at the uh, Vermont Care Board to um, take up this topic today. And in a minute, Susan will identify the uh, panelists and uh, talk about what we're going to be doing this morning. But this is a, a, a topic that um, uh, we at the Vermont Care Board take very serious in that we will not be just paying lip service to parity between physical and mental health. And uh, so having this type of uh, uh, feedback this morning from the advisory committee is going to be very, very helpful. And before I say too much, I did want to uh, recognize someone in the room who just came back from getting a national award. Sam Lish, you want to stand up? Sam was just honored in Washington and received the uh, Regional One Award for the outstanding work that uh, he has done. So thank you, Sam, for everything that you do. Thank you. So uh, the Greenmount Care Board in Title 18's uh, chapters 220 and 222 um, does have uh, a lot of uh, statutory um, duties when it comes to mental health. and. That was expanded, actually, in Act 200 this past year in making it very clear that mental health is on the same footing with physical health. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who will um, introduce our panelists. Um, we're on a tight timetable because we did take the feedback in the last meeting very seriously where the advisory committee members didn't feel they had enough time. So. Um, Panelists are, are going to be kept to that strict time limit, and uh, we'll move forward from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I introduce our panel, I wanted to give everyone an overview of what um, the agenda looks like today. Uh, we're going to start out hearing from our panelists, who I will introduce um, shortly, and they're going to be giving us a a, a, an insight from their perspective on what they feel are the biggest issues around mental health in the state of Vermont. And then we are going to break out into groups um, we, we, the panel discussion goes from 10:10 until 11:10. And then um, we will be breaking out into three separate groups and the um, topics of the groups, and you have, should have received all of this information beforehand. We'll have one group on workforce and education. We'll have one work group on capacity and need for beds. And then the third will be on access and quality. That will um, start, thank you, that will start at 11.10. I want to um, have Melissa Miles and Marissa Melamed and Michelle, please just stand up. So I'm going to have these Three staff members will be in different areas of the room, and that's how we'll break out. The room isn't perfect, but I think it's big enough that we can separate out. And they'll help facilitate those work groups. We're going to ask one person from the work group to then share out um, the answers to the questions that we uh, presented to you. And then um, we're going to, you'll report that back to the group and to the board. I want to remind folks that we're going to have a, a surveys for you of the meeting, and we please ask you to fill this out today. We'll have someone at the door collecting these on the way out. We really, really need feedback from you so that we can make these meetings as valuable as they can be, both for you and for the board. Um, so, Without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce the panel. So I'll start with Melissa Bailey, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health for the State of Vermont. Next to her is Julie Tesler, who is Vermont Care Partners Executive Director. And then next to Julie is Dr. Susan Deppy, from the, uh, she's a psychiatrist in Colchester, Vermont. And next to Dr. Deffy is Dr. Mark McGee. He is the Chief Medical Officer at Brattleboro Retreat. And next to Dr. McGee is Dr. Rick Barnett, and he is a psychologist in Stowe, Vermont. 
And last but not least is Devin Green, who is Vice President of Government Relations, Vermont Association of Hospital and Health Systems. We tried to make this a very broad group. We had to cut it off somewhere. <laughs> um, but we really did want to bring in different perspectives that we hadn't heard in the past and trying to um, cover as many bases as we possibly could. So unless you have anything else, Mr. Chair, I think well, we can turn it started. over to the panel. And I think we should start with Melissa. Sure, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start at a very high level because I think that it's important to recognize that the Department of Mental Health's responsibility really span a very um, broad continuum. Um, when we were um, reorganized out of the health department, um, statutory authority expanded to include the mental health of all Vermonters. And I think that the department has continued to sort of fine tune what that actually means for them, um, what their role should be in the mental health of all Vermonters versus their previous role that was primarily focused on just the, the most vulnerable. Um, so I think it's important to first talk about mental health on the continuum of health conditions. Um, many individuals experience a mental health issue sometime in their lifetime, whether it's dealing with anxiety, depression, or any other issue that any one of us on any given day may struggle with. Um, some people reach a level that a mental health condition may become more impactful in their life. Um, their condition may reach a point of meeting the threshold of a diagnosable condition, and some, but of course a smaller number, become very ill from their mental health condition, and it's ex extremely impactful on their, their life and their well-being. All of these conditions are treatable, some to a better degree than others, all impact a person's life, and each have overlapping and unique needs re and re needed responses to them, including treatment, social service supports, family supports, medication, I mean, the list can go on and on. So when we're talking about a group of individuals that are dealing with a mental health condition, their needs are just as unique as their diagnosis and their presentation may be. Um, in order to best address the continuum and the responsibility of the Department of Mental Health from the most vulnerable, but also looking at the mental health of all Vermonters, um, we must continuously look at responses and treatment from these different lenses. So just as some examples, we run the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and we also promote access to community providers such as the designated agencies, as well as promoting things that are like the crisis text line that are available for all Vermonters. Um, first and foremost, I think a system that focuses on health promotion, prevention, and early intervention will be our most effective um, while not pulling back from our responsibility of treating the most vulnerable or those that are really dealing with a serious mental illness. Just like addressing any health condition, staying healthy and preventing illness should be our first response. So when asked what is the greatest issue in Vermont regarding mental health and substance abuse treatment and access, we feel that the department must first think about how we're preventing and intervening early while not at all taking any of our attention away from our uh, biggest responsibility, again, treating the most vulnerable. But to that end, and because we don't have a system completely set up to do that, and because there are also um, will be people who need more, we need to focus our efforts and our responses on treatment, care, engagement, and ways to help people who do have a mental health illness recover, live in their community, and build resiliency skills. <coughs> These approaches, regardless of the more upstream or further downstream, must combine treatment options with addressing the other things that people need, like social determinants that I mentioned earlier. So without options to housing, um, secure food, safe neighborhoods, addressing loneliness and isolation, which has become more of front and center in the conversation around mental health concerns, um, having a purpose in life, having job skills and employment, relationships, and the skills to uh, address all those things um, has to be a part of what our system focuses on. Um, to start, I just want to highlight a little bit around children and families when I talk about health promotion and prevention. I think about it on a continuum and that can happen anywhere in somebody's life. But I am going to talk a little bit about um, Vermont families and what they're facing. Um, when we look at the adverse experiences, the most common in Vermont are income hardship, being separated or divorced, a parent or caregiver's own mental health issues, and or, and or substance abuse issues. And therefore, um, because of those concerns that families are facing, they struggle to provide their children with the environment to, in which they can grow and thrive, build resiliency, and obtain optimal health, um, or health and brain development. 
In response to these struggles, DMH has been looking at evidence-based practices. Um, so we continue to look at things like parent-child interaction therapy, parent-child psychotherapy, ways that we can really get into families as early and as preventative as possible. Um, children do best when they're living in families that are healthy, attending um, uh, their local schools, living in their communities. And while at times residential and inpatient care may be necessary for a child, we'd like to keep that as short term as possible. The same way we think about it for adults is that we want to move them back into the community as quickly as possible. Um, so although I know most of the focus and energy today is on the adult system, I did think that it was important to talk about the um, kids system. So I'm going to skip some things and get right to that. Um, <laughs> we also see individuals with serious mental illness that come about due to uh, genetic or other contributing factors, as well as kids or adults who have grown up in a family system that's um, challenged as the way that I've described earlier. So DMH's first priority is to focus on the crisis at hand, which is the emergency department and inpatient um, access. Um, working with legislators, advocacy groups, peers, individuals who are receiving services, um, hospitals, and others to address the need for inpatient beds for individuals with the most acute um, needs. This should include identifying and addressing, addressing the reasons people enter emergency departments in the first place and reasons people are not discharging from emergency departments. And as we saw in the Act 82 report and the deeper dive that UBMC did, it was clearly that the social fabric, um, the social supports, the housing supports, those were all um, very impactful and contributing factors to why people were challenged to discharging. And we can only make the assumption that in many cases that that's also a, a challenge of why they come to the ED in the first place, because they don't have access to those services and supports. That's not to say that there isn't um, an absolute need and time for inpatient care with really strong psychiatric response, but we can't forget about the social fabric that supports people um, when they're dealing with a crisis. Um, nobody fits neatly into any of the category or boxes that we have in our system, so we need to continue to work with the other providers. That could be the criminal justice system, schools, employers. The list can go on and on, and again, to describe individuals as fitting into any neat box would do injustice to any one of us. Um, clearly, people have unique needs, and we need to figure out how to continue to work with that. So um, again, I just will highlight, knowing that my time is probably running out, that um, I think we need um, to focus on the crisis at hand, the emergency departments and inpatients, but almost simultaneously or concurrent to that, really focus on these other pieces that contribute to people's well-being, both on the front end and on the back end, so that we're preventing people from reaching needing that level of care, but we're also doing everything we can to assure recovery and resiliency so when people come back into the community, they are successful and not needing that level of care again. Um, so I think I'll stop there rather than try to. Thank you. I'm Julie Tesser from Vermont Care Partners. Um, and I really want to thank the board for taking this up because from Vermont Care Partners' perspective, mental health, some use disorders are just part of health care. And if we're going to achieve the goals of containing costs, addressing health care quality of service, and better outcomes, we really need to look at it holistically. And this is just a great opportunity to do so. And our commitment to that is clear. We were working with the legislator making sure that mental health was part of um, the, the work of the Green Mountain Care Board, even saying, review our budgets. Uh, it's important. We're part of that health care expenditures, and we want to look at that in a holistic way. Um, and we see this as a really opportune time, the all-payer model and new value-based uh, models of payment enable us to look at how we finance healthcare in a whole new way. And so we're working with the Department of Health, the Agency of Human Services, Department of Aging and Independent Living around how do we pay for services and really focus on outcomes and flexibly meeting people's needs and integrating that into healthcare. So this is, I feel like this is like a, a real turning point and we can really move forward with it. So. This is an exciting time, even though, yes, we also are dealing with some crises. Um, the other reason I think it's really important is just how prevalent mental health conditions are. And, and Melissa mentioned some of it, but you know, one in five adults at any one year have a mental health condition. Um, half of us will over our lifetimes. And I think it's uh, one in 12 have a substance use disorder. So that's pretty prevalent, but it's even more prevalent in our Medicaid population. We look at public resources, we're putting a lot of public resources into Medicaid. So one in four Medicaid beneficiaries have a mental health condition and one in 10 have a substance use disorder. 
Um, and of the, if you look at the highest spending in Medicaid, the top 5%, you will also see um, that 50% of them have a mental health condition and 18 to 20% have a substance use disorder. So more of a reason where we really need to focus on this population. Additionally, the co-occurring nature of mental health and other health conditions is very significant. And when you have a mental health condition on top of another health condition, you are more likely to have higher expenditures um, and, and the, kind of a rougher journey. Uh, and, the, and the comorbidity is just so important. So back to the mental health crisis. Um, I think we're all very aware of the uh, issues with our emergency rooms and, and inpatient backup and designated agencies are working really hard to look towards solutions, to work with the hospitals, to help people flow back out, to develop that social fabric, housing resources, uh, care coordination, integrate services for people. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I think the other panelists will, will do a great deal on that. Um, but another issue, again, that we don't think about too much is that people with serious mental illness tend to die 15 to 30 years younger than other people. And I think that's a very critical issue we need to look at. And you might assume, well, that must be suicide and overdose and, and accidents, things related to the mental health condition. But that's not actually true. They're dying from the same things. Or most people are dying from comorbidity with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, and things like that. So we really need to look at that together. There's also clinical bias. When someone with a mental health condition presents a clinical need, very often um, the response, and, and really this is coming from the New York Times, and um, is, well, it doesn't matter that much. That person's really already ill, or you know, what's the point? Uh, they're you know, just not giving the person the same level of attention. And then there's diagnostic overshadowing when the person with a mental health condition presents, or a person with substance use disorder presents a, a health care need. Again, the thought is, oh, that's just their mental illness. Of course, they have headaches, or they're just, you know, it's other things going on, and not giving people the level of medical attention they need. So we really need to look at those medical issues. And kind of looking at the panel, seeing about <laughs> addictions. Um, I think we're very aware of the opioid crisis. It's tremendous. Uh, it's growing. We're working very hard as a state to provide treatment and support. Um, and I, I mean, I, the, one of the serious problems with it, though, is that a lot of people who have addictions aren't getting treatment, like up to 90%. So we need, even though we're providing so much and we've expanded so much, there's so much more to do. Um, and I think we often overlook alcohol addiction. Many, many Vermonters suffer from alcohol addiction, 37,000 Vermonters. And what's even more striking to me is that um, we have, in 2016, there are 293 deaths from alcohol addiction um, compared to about 100 in opioid addiction. The deaths from alcohol addiction are related more to chronic conditions than they are. Than, so it's not like an overdose, it's not in your face but we're having as many deaths, as much suffering, it affects families. So I, I think we really need to spend more time focusing on alcohol than we currently do. Suicide is also a common issue that we really is growing and deserves and continues to deserve attention. There is work being done. Um, there's a zero suicide um, program that's being developed in a number of agencies with leadership from the Department of Health. Um, and I'll go faster because of the five minutes. I also just want to point out several underserved populations because I think it's important to do that. Um, children of parents uh, with opiate addiction um, are really having a tough time. Not only do the children need support, the families need support. Sometimes that's the grandparents, sometimes it's the child care center. But we really need to be able to work with those families more. Elders have a very high rate of suicide, a very high rate of alcohol abuse. Um, loneliness. It's very hard to serve that population. Many of them are homebound, can't get out. Um, so I think we could do more there. LGBTQ youth have very high rates of depression and suicide. And as much as we think we do a lot, we really need more resources in our communities to serve that population. New Americans are another group that um, it's, a, it's a struggle. We, you know, we're trying to develop resources. The Howard Center has done a great deal of work, but there's not a lot of specialized resources. Clinicians who know the population, speak the languages, who understand the cultures. Um, 
families in need of in-home support and care coordination, this is an interesting one. If you have Medicaid, you can get a full range of supports to address some of the issues that Melissa mentioned. If you have private insurance, it's much harder to access that full range of in-home supports that you need to address mental health and addiction issues. And uh, going back to early childhood and families, um, the more we can do for that, for those folks, and schools are asking for supports and we just have limited resources. I do want to say we need to look at the underlying issues. Stigma is really very high. It creates feelings of shame, inferiority, failure, brokenness, um, and people then are afraid to access treatment, and I think that's one of the reasons that so many people with some use disorders and mental health are not getting treatment. It's not just the funding, it's also their own feelings about it and the way they're treated by society and, their, and our culture around that. Um, the other part is um, that we really don't have parity. We have moved strongly in that direction, but as long as we continue to cap funding in Medicaid and under reimburse the services, we are never going to really have full parity, and that also really prevents access. Designated agencies really would like to do more. We get limited because our reimbursement rates are too low to attract clinicians and staff. We also are just capped. We, you know, so it's both our reimbursement rates and the amount of services, of funding available to provide the supports. In the case of private clinicians, many of them will not accept the rates of Medicaid insurance, and so people don't have a lot of choices about where to go. So those underlying issues I would like to see addressed, but um, there's a lot of work to do, but we're also optimistic that um, we can do this, working together, the Green Mountain Care Board, the Agency of Human Services, the department, private clinicians and providers, and designated agencies. Um, we, we can make some really important progress, so we're excited to be part of that and to work with you all. I, I was wondering, Mr. Mullen, if I could go after some of the others to tailor my presentation to not go over the same things. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate that. You might get a more concise presentation. I guess that would make me next. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the board for um, this opportunity just to uh, talk about some vitally important uh, issues. Uh, that it affects uh, so many uh, Vermonters. Uh, when I think about this, um, I uh, often think about uh, the words of wisdom of a mentor and teacher of mine in medical school and residency at the University of Vermont, this is Jim Hudjack, who's a child psychiatrist. And Jim would often say that there is no health without mental health. And so I think that we are finally at a point where we're beginning to discuss these issues as front and center. Um, and central to the health um, of uh, every Vermonter and our communities and our economy. Um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I think taking a holistic and integrated approach to addressing these issues is critically important. Um, as an example, as an economic driver, the number one cause of um, a lost productivity in industry is mental health. Uh, approximately 625 billion with a B billion dollars per year is lost um, in industry because people are depressed. They're present. There's this phenomenon called presenteeism, meaning you're so depressed, you're at your desk, you're not doing anything, you're not producing anything, you're not contributing. Um, and so I think within industry, there's opportunities to address this in terms of promoting health and wellness among our uh, employee population. I think at other extremes, there are um, obviously incredibly ill individuals who require very high levels of intense care. There are uh, individuals in our departments of corrections. Uh, the Department of Corrections is currently the single most uh, largest provider of mental health services uh, nationwide. Uh, we often incarcerate people because of mental illness. So uh, there are legal solutions. Uh, there are primary care solutions. There are well-established models that allow for addressing uh, many of these challenges. And so really, I think the, the biggest barrier uh, to uh, succeeding uh, in these endeavors is really about access. Access to high quality care, access to timely care, access to affordable care. And so, uh, as I think our panelists already have um, identified, there are multiple levels of analysis that we can begin to look at. Um, primary prevention is obviously incredibly important. Substance use disorders, so working with schools, working uh, with pediatric um, practices in terms of preventing the onset 
of substance use disorders. If you can delay the first use of alcohol and other drugs beyond the age of 15, the rate of substance use disorders among young people decreases by nearly 50%. Um, and so these are important public health opportunities for us. Um, other opportunities uh, about access, there are very well established evidence-based and supported uh, practice models that until recently we currently had no economic model to support. Um, so there's a collaborative care model of primary care psychiatry that uses extremely vitally and rare expert opinions not to treat in, uh, patients individually, but instead to treat panels of patients. So for instance, uh, an hour of psychiatric expertise can be shared with a primary care provider. They can run 15 or 20 cases and really enhance the primary care provider's ability to effectively treat individuals in their practice Whereas that same hour can only be used to treat one individual directly by that psychiatrist. And so there are well-established models, strongly supported by evidence, but currently with our reimbursement structures as they are, there is no way to pay for that care unless the primary care practice sets that as a vital priority and decides to integrate that into their own financial models. Thankfully, um, CMS has recently um, uh, developed some billing mechanisms, some CPT codes that, that are beginning to support those practices. Again, strong evidence base to support vitally uh, important, uh, groundbreaking, innovative approaches to providing care, expanding access, and our economic systems, our funding systems have to catch up in order to help support that. And so I think if we step back a moment and we look at some of the challenges, many of the challenges are our funding streams, our funding mechanisms have not caught up to the science. We have the medical science to say that we can really move the, uh, the needle on many of these initiatives. We need to get uh, legislative support for pushing these things forward. We need to get some of uh, our uh, reimbursement mechanisms to push these, some of these models forward. Uh, most of my work is at the Brattleboro Retreat, where we um, uh, every day treat the sickest um, psychiatrically ill patients uh, in the state. Um, and we have a vitally important role in that, and we are faced with challenges day in and day out. And the challenges that we often face are, again, with access, getting really highly skilled psychiatrists to work in our hospital, getting patients the care that they need, both in our system of care and beyond, um, trying to work with um, our hospital partners throughout the state in terms of developing solutions to get psychiatric care in the emergency departments where, where individuals too often find themselves uh, stuck, ill, in distress, stressing the local systems of care out, waiting for a bed, not having access. So um, some of the things that we've been working on is how do we use telehealth solutions, telemedicine solutions to address uh, many of those critical issues. So at the retreat, we've developed a program in which we have been using telemedicine on our inpatient service, and it's been highly effective. We've succeeded in recruiting uh, four full-time, uh, five full-time uh, psychiatrists to provide telepsychiatry in our hospital and health system. We're working on partnering with emergency departments throughout uh, the state to allow um, telemedicine to be uh, implemented in emergency departments so we can get psychiatric care to patients where they are, when they need it, as opposed to somebody waiting four, five, six, 10, 20 days in an emergency department without seeing a psychiatrist when they're in the midst of a psychiatric crisis. We can do better, we have the opportunity, we have the technology, I think we just need to use Vermont innovation uh, and Vermont creativity and flexibility to get the services where they need in the time that they need, it, need to get there. So I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to share ideas, uh, to think about uh, solutions, to identify barriers to implementing uh, meaningful and effective change, uh, because this is too critically an important issue uh, to just to be left, uh, uh, left on its own. So thank you for the time. Thanks. Uh, Rick Barnett, I'm a psychologist and addictions counselor in Stowe. I'm also the legislative chair for the Vermont Psychological Association, past president. So I, but I represent really myself as a, as a community provider in Lamoille County. I was just listening to people talk about the suicide issue in Vermont, and Lamoille County has uh, five times the suicide rate as uh, Grand Isle County. So we see suicide rates uh, 35 percent higher in the state of Vermont than uh, nationally. And uh, this is a very serious issue. The, the, the thing that uh, stands out from many of the meetings that we've all been to uh, regarding the all-payer model and healthcare reform is the uh, focus, I think, that uh, Pat Jones delivered uh, a couple of years ago, and it's a very uh, a primary, import uh, primary importance, and that is 
the three areas that the Green Mountain Care Board wants to focus on and is legislatively uh, directed to is to increase access to primary care, to reduce, de reduce deaths to suicide and drug overdose, which in and of itself is confusing because it's hard to distinguish between the two sometimes, and reduce the prevalence of morbidity of chronic disease. All of those areas, primary care, drug abuse and suicide, as well as chronic disease, put mental health and behavioral health front and center when it comes to any discussion. Every meeting I've been to, which is many, whether it's a steering committee for the uh, SIM grant or a blueprint meeting or uh, a vital meeting or any of these meetings, mental health comes up consistently, consistently. And it doesn't matter if it's a mental health focused discussion or just general health care discussion, whether it's uh, surgery or hospital financing, mental health comes up regularly. So this is the fourth time I've presented to the Green Mountain Care Board on, on mental health, and it's a, it's a delight to do so every time, and hopefully we will continue to make progress, and I believe we have made progress so far. I have a lot of different areas that I would, would want to focus on, but to keep it as concise as possible, some people have mentioned already uh, GERO, psychology, GERO uh, geriatrics, as well as uh, uh, the population of teenagers or young, younger populations. So we, we can think about the population of 18 to 65 and what their mental health or behavioral health needs might be. But if we really want to look at reducing costs and improving quality of care, we really want to look on the prevention side of things and getting kids access to quality care or resources, even if it's not formal mental health care, but resources on the front end. And then having worked for five years full time in nursing homes providing GERO psychology services and assistance with medication decisions, uh, even as a psychologist, uh, I know that the uh, mental health services in nursing homes is, is uh, a much, much needed res uh, resource. And one of the problems, I think, is in, in the all-payer model, as I remember reviewing the term sheet before we signed the agreement, was that LADCs, licensed alcohol and drug counselors, were included as a eligible provider under the all-payer waiver model. Now, previously under Medicare, LADCs are not eligible providers. So I was delighted to see that LADCs were included on that term sheet. I'm not actually sure if they are in the current model as it exists. But one thing that did not get included was master's level psychologists and licensed for, uh, clinical mental health counselors were not included as uh, a waived provider group. This is a huge group of providers who can do a great deal of quality care, but are currently excluded from being reimbursed by Medicare for mental health services. And that's a huge issue, that, and it's a huge ask that I, that I bring to the table every time I, I have the opportunity to present. Um, the other thing regarding addiction, because it is something I'm obsessed with, near and dear to my heart, personally and professionally, is uh, as, as much progress as the hub and spoke model has, has achieved uh, in uh, getting people access to medication. Uh, if you look at the Department of Health report that came out about a year ago, uh, despite the glowing reviews that seemed to present, uh, it clearly indicated that mental health services, the quality of the physical environment in some of the hubs, as well as the quality of the mental health services, regardless of whether it was a hub or a spoke, was not good. It was poorly rated by most people, family members, patients, and there's a high level of burnout, uh, whether it's uh, uh, counselors or uh, primary care providers who are getting more and more trained to, to address the complex nature of addiction. So if we were gonna invest time and energy and money into improving the hub and spoke model or addiction treatment model, it would not only be to really enhance our efforts around mental health, but also, I believe, uh, I think, we, what, what did Melissa say a little while ago? I forgot what it was, I lost my train of thought there. But uh, to really reduce the emphasis on, on medication only and to broaden that to uh, peer recovery supports, which we have a great uh, Vermont recovery network, peer recovery supports, uh, psychosocial services, not as a requirement, uh, because I think some people would get, uh, have a barrier to access to like buprenorphine or methadone if they are absolutely required to have mental health services. I don't think that's a good idea. I have plenty of patients who have been on buprenorphine for five years, and the fact that they're required to come see me for mental health services seems like a joke, because they're fine, and they don't need to, you know, it should, it's like a, it's written into the rules, I guess. They have to have to be seen like once a month or something, but, um, but it's still, it's a really, really important piece of the whole addiction. Oh, I know what it was, it was, it was Julie was talking about alcohol. 
I mean, that's the whole thing that gets lost in the hub and spoke thing, is this poly drug use, alcohol use. People are still dying in very, very high numbers because their mental health isn't being addressed, and there seems to be permissiveness around continued alcohol use, cannabis use, benzo use. We're doing a good job in trying to address it, but it's something that I think is, could, could be addressed in a, more, in a more focused way to reduce the death rate. And finally, I think I've got a couple minutes left. Um, I want to make a mention of two other things. One is, uh, a, a, again, to the scope of practice issue. I believe we have a robust workforce. There are 800, there are 800 practitioners in part-time or full-time private practice in the state of Vermont. We are not talking about necessarily the most severe and persistent mentally ill people, the people that utilize hospital-based services for crisis care, but there's a huge network of providers out there ready, willing, and able to treat a vast number of Vermonters who are not necessarily in crisis, but post-crisis. And the linkage between hospital systems, medical homes, uh, uh, hub and spoke, uh, between them and the independent practitioner community is weak, is, frankly, and it's something I've been trumping for a long time. And there are great opportunities to provide better linkages and collaboration with all these providers out there, uh, assuming that some of us are willing to do that. Not everybody, you know, a lot of people are in independent practice because they want to be in independent practice. But um, whether it's the all-payer model or, or partnering with, uh, with one care, you know, there are great opportunities there. I know Otter Creek has, has started to do that. Um, scope of practice, again, there's great providers out there. We live in a silo-based world. You do this, I do that. And I think that competency-based care is a much better model. Um, one thing that I've been advocating for is prescriptive authority for pr appropriately trained psychologists. Uh, nurse practitioners prescribe a ton of psychiatric medications. Physician assistants do. Primary care docs prescribe a lot of psych meds. We've got great psychiatrists in the state, but there is a shortage there. We're bringing tele telehealth into the state more, which is great, but there is a, a growing population of psychologists who are qualified to prescribe, which I would advocate for any chance I get. And finally, with regards to technology, I think we are not investing enough, not necessarily vital for the good work that they do, but in very practical ways, not just traditional telehealth, like online therapy, 45 minute, 30 minute consult kind of thing, but leveraging the amazing world of technology, whether it's a virtual reality, augmented reality, um, uh, text-based op options like our suicide uh, text uh, opportunity for people. But this is an area, I believe, especially when it comes to teens, if we're gonna help people, there's a report that came out of uh, the Wellbeing Trust showing that teens consume all of their healthcare information and frankly treatment, 75, 80% of it online, online. So if we're gonna invest in mental health, care, quality, getting people access, uh, this is an area I think to focus on. So that's my shtick, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Devin Green with the Hospital Association, and I just wanted to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for having us here today and talking about, um, continuing to talk about the mental health crisis. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the partnership that the Green Mountain Care Board has done with the increasing inpatient capacity in Central Vermont, uh, the agreement that they came to earlier this year with the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, we think that that was a really good example of collaboration um, with the Green Mountain Care Board. We also appreciate what the legislature has done for expanding inpatient capacity at the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, and we just want to make sure that, uh, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so this is more for the outside world. We don't want people to throw up their hands and say, all right, we expanded inpatient capacity, we're done, the crisis is solved. Um, we want to keep pushing forward. We know that the crisis is not solved, and we need to do we need to do things at every uh, part of the continuum of care. So we really want to um, advocate for that going forward. Um, I've spent a lot of time on um, various groups, and the groups I've spent time on, there's been some common themes that have come out of those groups in the discussion and some of them we talked about today but we've heard about need for more coordination of care um, and I think we're getting to a better place with that um, as Julie was saying I think you know uh, organizations are working together a bit more I think there's a lot of room for improvement with the um, with the private practices and I certainly welcome 
anything that we could do there. Um, uh, there's always talk about geriatric psychiatric support and juvenile psychiatric support. Um, and as well as housing and loneliness. Um, I'm really struck by how often I hear uh, about loneliness. And I think um, it's something to shine a little bit more light on. I've heard of other hospitals where their hospital volunteers are sort of just sitting at their desks, uh, greeting people as they come in. If they have downtimes, they will call folks. Um, and they were usually using this mainly for elderly folks who use uh, care as a social outlet. But you know, there are little things we can do, like calling folks, checking in, seeing how they're doing. And it doesn't have to be done by a medical professional necessarily or take a whole lot of time and expense. So um, I think it's really great that I've heard other people talk about loneliness here as well. Um, uh, another common theme has been data collection. So one thing that we realized last year was that um, there's a ton of great data at the uh, um, Department of Mental Health on involuntary folks uh, and no data on uh, people who are voluntary. Uh, so we saw this as a big problem. We did started, we started collecting data at our designated hospitals that have inpatient units. Um, and we have just about a year's worth of data at this point. Um, and we are almost ready to share it. I get very <laughs> hesitant about it because it is still imperfect. What it's been, how it's been collected is sort of hand collected into spreadsheets. Um, we're still working on, you know, we have enough, we still have this number where it's more people uh, who are not discharged than beds available, so we know that there's something wrong there. We're still sort of reconciling and matching it up, but one of the things that we found initially is that there's no necessarily thing, necessarily anything that has jumped out at us as an issue. Um, we've been collecting data on folks who are involuntary versus voluntary, people who are receiving CRT or who are CRT status, um, uh, people who are designated as level one, and, um, and sort of other populations. And when we try to break the populations down, we find that uh, the longest stay populations are the one, are the people who are currently not discharged. Um, so we've broken it down by discharge versus not discharged, and we found that about 6% of the patients who are currently not discharged make up 28% uh, of the total bed days in the system. Um, we had looked at this data back in February, and it was an even more dramatic number where it was essentially 5% of patients who are not discharged make up uh, almost half of the bed days in the system. Uh, so we've since learned that a couple of people were discharged and that has skewed the data a lot. Um, but there's, uh, you know, when we look at those not discharged people, it looks like about half are involuntary, half are voluntary. Um, there's no real trends coming out from there, which I think may get to Melissa's point of how some people just really need more individualized look. Um, and I think there are a lot of great um, programs going on that are doing exactly that. Um, I think hospitals and the designated agencies are doing some really interesting pilot projects that have come out with a lot of effective results. Um, and VPQHC had a great presentation on this a month or two ago uh, where they highlighted um, that Washington County Mental Health was, uh, you know, talking about a pilot project where they were coordinating care and really doing individualized care and working in teams and providing wraparound services. I know in um, Northwestern, uh, they've done a, they've also partnered with their DA to do a really great program that focused on high ED utilizers and um, working with them and really wrapping around services and providing an individual, uh, individualized plan for them. Um, and I know uh, Northeastern with Paul Bankston, uh, he's been partnering with agencies to coordinate care even further. So I do think that that 
approach provides great results. And then finally, um, as Rick was saying, I do think that we should look at the idea of further use of technology. Um, VPQHC highlighted Brattleboro Retreat doing a pilot project called the Telefriend uh, Telehealth System where uh, some patients are sent home with essentially like an iPad um, and they just check in every day. And um, there was a really small sample size study done in either New Hampshire or Massachusetts, but they had fantastic results of, I think, reducing readmissions by 80%. So um, Brattleboro Retreat is focusing on that um, pilot project right now. And if that has good results, it'd be great to expand that a bit more. So. Um, I think going forward, you know, we should continue with data collection. I know we're working with other organizations, including the DAs, to put that data all together a little bit more and provide a more complete picture of the system. Um, and uh, just also keep looking at these pilot projects, see where there are areas of opportunity for um, easy and helpful, easy and not easy uh, fixes to the system, such as you know, maybe phoning people who are lonely versus coordinating a lot of care for individuals. Um, and I think that's all I have. So. Hi. Um, I wanted to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for not only focusing on mental health because all Vermonters deserve access to care, but also applauding that hospital initi initiative that you're working on with UVM. Um, we also thank you guys for working on the association benefit plans to try to pre prevent the weakening of benefits, which I understand you're doing. Um, I am speaking on behalf of the Vermont Psychiatric Association. I collected a lot of thoughts from colleagues. This is not a data-driven presentation. I will leave out the things that my colleagues up here have talked about in general, or unless I'm reinforcing them. Um, so we all know about suicide. We all know that there's been a huge need for psychiatric nursing home beds um, for years. I've had horror stories from my colleagues about where, do you, where, where does the senior go when he or she has a severe mental illness when a nursing home won't take them. Um, emergency and other services, and Julie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, for de developmental disabilities have often been shortchanged and need more resources. Um, that's been a problem for a long time, according to some of my experts. Um, more outpatient psychiatrists. When I first came to Burlington in 1983, there were scads of outpatient psychiatrists in the phone book. Um, clearly, our workforce has collapsed over the last 30 years. We can thank payment models and managed care for that. Um, another thing that we've needed has been, that I've noticed in my practice is that when I have a patient with a dissociative disorder or severe trauma, I've had to send them out of state. We don't have an inpatient unit that has handled that well in my experience. Um, many young people, my colleagues have said, who would be good psychiatrists are becoming PAs because they can't afford medical school. We had extensive dialogue about that earlier in the summer about loans and repayment and so on, and we happily support efforts in that direction. Um, I won't go into detail about the fallout from too few, few psychiatrists. Um, there are some nightmare scenarios. The Vermont School for Girls, which takes extremely ill individuals, um, right now has somebody who they can't discharge because they can't find an outpatient psychiatrist. And this is somebody who's been there for four years with multiple psychiatric diagnoses. Um, some of us don't know how we're going to retire because we don't know who's going to take care of our folks. Um, I may have to start planning that now if I'm going to retire in five years, who knows. Um, and there's certainly lack of enforcement of the parity laws, which I've heard from my colleagues as well. Disparities in pay, disparities in recertification or prior authorization processes that are a real hassle. Insurers refusing to cover drug screens and substance abuse, but covering them for medical things, that sort of thing. Um, repeating a medical pre-cert when somebody's already on the medication and a simple one such as lorazepam, which Medicare requires, but I know we may not be able to do anything about that, but it's abjectly stupid for me to call in and have the main question be, did the doctor reassess the risks? Duh. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's, Great stupidity. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, as the final example, was told by a Medicare drug plan that she couldn't prescribe new Dexta for um, pseudomulbar affect. She was actually involved with clinical trials. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff out there that really frustrates those of us in practice and makes it very hard to try to do what you know your patients need. Um, we have talked about how many families aren't able to provide environments that support good brain development, and I couldn't strongly enough support all of the efforts in, into prevention, you know, working with kids, working with whole families, and I know that my colleague, um, Dr. Ratu, had said you something as well, which I reiterated partly in my handout, uh, or mostly in my handout. Um, there's a dismally small number of private practice child psychiatrists, and part of that is reimbursement. There is so much work involved for all psychiatrists, but particularly on the adult, on the child and on the um, geriatric end of the spectrum, with collateral sources of information and care coordination. Um, there's a lot of it in general psych, but it's worse in those two areas, and you don't get paid for that. And I know a psychiatrist whose child certified would be a brilliant child psychiatrist who's not practicing child because he or she can't get paid to do all of that collateral information gathering that is required. Um, and I won't go through the rest of Dr. Ratu's suggestions. Um, the current structure of mental health practice and financing, needless to say, isn't supporting all of us in private practice, whether we're psychiatrists or other clinicians. Um, and The current system also doesn't fund us to do what our patients need. Um, and I will go over one or two other things. There are a lot of hurdles from pharmacy benefit managers and so on that are really stressful for patients as well as wasting the time of pharmacists and psychiatrists. If the board can do anything about regulating that within Vermont, I, I know you may not have control over Medicare, although you can try, but if we could regulate any company that's working in Vermont, including Medicaid, that would be very helpful. Many years ago, we had a, once you've done the pre-cert for a psychotropic you, in Medicaid, I think, you had it for a lifetime as long as the patient was on it. I'm not sure where that went, but it seems to have gone away. Let's reinstate it. It would save a lot of wasted time. Um, so obviously, you're hearing assessing the needs statewide and building capacity, and we appreciate that as much as you have the power to do in working with the legislature. Um, I've mentioned a couple of those needs. Investing in prevention is enormously important. Um, multimodal care, as we've talked about, it's not all about psychopharmacology. I would lovingly differ with my psychologist colleague about that. Um, oftentimes, that's not going to be the solution. The solution is getting families involved in um, multimodal care. That's well documented. Uh, rebuilding, and this is where my suggestions come in, or recommendations, rebuilding the psychiatric mental health primary care workforce, particularly in outpatient practice, um, which is my area of expertise. Obviously, the residency stipends and helping with payments for medical and graduate school would help. Obviously, raising reimbursement would help. Um, please consider using your rate-setting power to get payers to shift the healthcare dollar, a higher percentage of the healthcare dollar progressively year upon year for about five years to primary care and mental health. The Rhode Island, have you heard the study that Alan Ramsey, the studies that Alan Ramsey talked about, Rhode Island and, and so on? Rhode Island saved 18% just by making the shift without even doing single payer, okay? Just shifting to primary care. We are not focusing on the things that are gonna save us the money. Um, if you also fund mental health, it saves a lot of money because as Julie and others have pointed out, the lifetime costs and suffering in medical issues and social issues related to mental health are enormous. So if we do the investment, we can help Vermont be infinitely healthier and save money. I would recommend that include mental health and primary care. And to the extent that we need to, substance abuse as well. I don't have data for that. You all have that, because that's not my area of expertise. Um, so please use your rate setting power to push that priority. And that will help the pay disparity. 
please help with the parity issue. As you mentioned, uh, Mr. Mullen, thank you so much. And support those essential and innovative, and I'm almost done, um, ways of caring. If we could be paid for those collateral contacts, and I don't care whether I paid a reasonable salary or by the hour, which would probably work for me in my tiny practice. I can't be done per capita because it's just not going to work. But if we were paid reasonably for collateral contact, for getting that information, for collabor collaborating with therapists, schools, parents, other clinicians, that would be amazingly effective. It would, it would make us so much more useful. It would be great if we could pay for phone work with patients, particularly emergency calls. We get a lot of, I can't imagine the number of hours I've spent for no pay with my patients on the phone. You don't even want to think about it. I could have made twice as much money. Pay for psychiatrists, this is one of the ideas that came up and was well documented, I think Dr. McGee. Telephone consultation with primary care. We've wanted to do that for years and haven't figured out a way to get it funded, except in the pediatric area, there's been some funding. Please help us think about ways to push the payers to do that because it makes us more effective. Most of us love working with our primary care colleagues. I certainly do. So that kind of either telephone or face-to-face, -face, one case after another, without having to see the patient, could be very useful, but of course, we're gonna to have to be careful because there are some patients where primary care may think they know what's going on and there's actually some other psychiatric stuff that they're not picking up. So it requires judgment. <laughs> and finally, one of my colleagues suggested possibly tying payment to access in the alternative payment models and paying new urgent evaluations and consults higher so that they are the number of consults that got taken would, would increase and the number of days to a new patient eval would be tied to patient to payment. Those are the ideas, that last part is really our our most important ideas and we really thank you for holding this together. Great. So um, thank you all very much for that uh, insight into your um, the work you're doing uh, in representing uh, the, the mental health areas that you work in. Um, what we are going to do now is we're a little bit ahead of schedule, actually. Um, I could, Wait, can we use that five minutes? Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Um, sure. do, you, do you want? Do you guys want to ask some questions, or do you want to open it up Let's to them? Up I, think that, I think that would be great. Sure. So we can open it up for the next. 10 minutes. Is that okay, Christina? We'll be okay for some questions for the panelists. So, sure. I think Paul was first. <laughs> I don't know. I was looking at my. But uh, you know, I really appreciate what you folks have presented, and um, I, I really like what I'm hearing, and I agree with uh, much of what you said. I, I like the whole idea of looking at um, um, uh, people as people in populations as people. I think that's really good. I have a very specific prevention-related question though. Um, how many of you have heard of wellness recovery action plans? So most of you have. Um, how much do you know about how much they're used? Yeah, I believe there are trainings and DAs. It's been like started, was it 20 years ago or, or even more? Um, so um, it's funny, I looked at the website just last week because I was telling uh, Mark Redman at Spectrum House about it, wondering whether we could have those for uh, specifically for adolescents, because there's actually uh, right. graphs that are specific to specific populations now. All right. Um, so it, yes, it's I'm just cool. curious if you even have uh, at, at the designated agencies as a whole have like a, a, a percentage understanding of who uses them and what are the strategies um, we're implementing because just listening around to different people and agencies, uh, it, it, it puzzles me why more people, and I know there are different uh, wellness recovery plans for different populations, but it puzzles me that the, the percentage of people who uh, uh, have developed those uh, with 
caregivers of any sort. Um, the percentage is pretty low, and it'd be really cool if we could get it up around 100%, because I strongly believe prevention is really where it's at. We're thinking about beds and all of that sort of thing. Um, that's going to be a never-ending challenge unless we get to the determinants. My colleagues here from designated agencies have to know more about the, the level of implementation that we have right now. Yeah, I couldn't either. I, we can I, get I, that information, I but piece of I just don't know it off the top of my head. would mean that we really uh, accelerate that that strategy. It's not a, it's not a strategy that's reimbursed, but yeah. we're used to that. <laughs> it should be, but it's not. It's a great recommendation. Yeah. We'll look into it. Yes. Yeah, I have uh, two somewhat unrelated uh, points that I'd like to raise. First of all, um, Rick's idea that, of dissociating, uh, having buprenorphine go on with only prescribers involved, I don't agree with. I, as a primary care internist, I was running behind almost every day to work with complica mostly complicated geriatric patients, a lot of medical problems. And I am not have time to really do what it takes to look into the mental health of the people who were receiving buprenorphine. It's a highly addictive drug. I couldn't, there was diversion going on, and I just didn't have time. I agree with you 100%. I, 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 was, I was not, I, didn't, I don't so know if I was misunderstood. I think leaking that, and I also want to say that, um, so I'm in Spring, I work in Springfield now, and on the inpatient service, and I think it's not a good idea to not require the prisoners who are receiving buprenorphine to have counseling going on too. And it's, they're allowed to, to opt out of it if they don't feel like going, and often they don't feel like going. And you have to remember a lot of people in prisons have a disproportionate amount of mental health comorbidity, personality disorders, and other issues. And I think it's really important to to make sure they're getting linked into substance counselors and other mental health personnel and not just that prescribing going on without that because I think you get a lot more people addicted. Buprenorphine is a highly addictive drug. Keep that in mind. It's not a panacea. It's a highly addictive modified narcotic. I think we should be really careful. I agree and I don't, I don't want to be misquoted. I did not suggest that people should not do mental health counseling. I was suggesting that the requirement at a certain stage of recovery process can become a barrier. That's what I meant. Okay, Sam. And I just want to just uh, respond, if I may. And I'm sorry, what is your name? Marvin Malik. Nice to, nice to meet you, Dr. Malik. Um, so um, there, um, I, as I understand the Suboxone prescribing, it's the requirement of the prescribers only to have access to a referral. It's not actually required as part of that treatment. Federal law. Uh, but as someone who is actively involved in providing um, Suboxone treatment, I think it's, a, it's an important aspect of that recovery. But I think this is where we can get, um, we can look at innovative treatment models that allow for a very robust treatment environment, but do so uh, recognizing that access access to still skilled clinicians is is a real challenge and so I think um, you know for Rick to see an individual for one hour per month as a requirement may not be the best utilization of his expertise however uh, one of the models that we've explored is a group approach to suboxone treatment in which you have the prescribing clinician part of that therapeutic encounter along with another mental health clinician at LADC, licensed social worker, uh, LMHC, et cetera. And so what I found having done that, uh, done that work for several years now is that even people in very, very stable recovery, they still have something to benefit from that clinical encounter. They support each other in a peer support mechanism. They have access to a medical professional to say, hey, tell me about this aspect of my suboxone treatment. Can you tell me about this other aspect of my primary care needs? So, and as part of that process, we're doing ongoing screenings for mental health needs. We can make referrals as necessary and appropriate within the context. And it's a 90 minute scheduled group that we have up to 10 individuals participating. And so it becomes an incredibly efficient use of scarce clinical resources. Um, it, I think, adheres to the integrity, the intended integrity of that particular treatment model. 
Um, and I think it really uh, results in really excellent outcomes at a relatively low cost. Um, and so I think there's different ways that we can work within that system uh, to share ideas about novel and innovative approaches to ensure our patients get the need that they want in a, in a, in a rational and sensible fashion. Okay, Sam. The, the other point I wanted to make is that at Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, where I worked for a year and a half, um, there, there's highly, it's an extremely expensive place to run, highly trained staff, and the patients are spending tremendous amounts of time not being treated. They're violent, they're a threat to the staff. We have the injury rate of assault on the staff is very high. And, uh, and at the same time, the majority of patients have some version of paranoid schizophrenia. And they all don't want to be treated because they're paranoid. And so they, the, legal, the structure of how things are going legally is that they get lawyers and they all don't want to be treated and they're there not being treated month after month after month after month and they're taking up a bed that could be given to somebody who actually well, wants to be so treated or, or who's already been uh, legally adjudicated. They're through the legal system rather than going through all these legal delays. What a waste of, of staff expertise. It was painful to work there. It's the most inefficient system. I think maybe I'll go base proposal for a forensic unit where if the people are still in the phase of refusing to be treated, that they would be tying up beds at VPCH. It's just it's so inefficient. So well, it's, we're knows. operating within the laws that we have in the state, and they, we don't have a mandate to re restore competency. So there's many things that contribute to, and, and I would say that um, in the last year and a half, under new leadership at the hospital, things have begun to shift. Um, and you know, I would invite you to, to talk with folks and hear more about what's happening there now. I think there was some work a year or two, a few years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, on trying to shorten that time that people had to be in before you could go for involuntary medication. There were some legal changes, um, but we're still talking about uh, a, a criminal justice system involvement if you're talking about people that have um, potential charges but are not um, going through the court system because of competency. Um, that involves a lot of civil uh, liberties and rights that need to also be considered. Um, the question is, is VPCH the best place for them when it's denying care for when we have a crisis in the inpatient model. I can maybe um, comment. Um, we deal with this um, this particular situation at the Brattleboro Retreat uh, on an ongoing basis. As of yesterday, I think we had 32 involuntary patients. So essentially an equivalent or sometimes higher census of individuals in the care and custody of the Department of Mental Health. And it's as a as a clinician and as an administrator, it's something that I, I you know I struggle with because it is it's frustrating to, to to care for patients and to watch them suffer greatly from a very serious and untreated illness. It's what it's it's frustrating to watch our staff really wanting to help them get better, but because of the nature of the illness, it often impairs their ability to recognize that they're ill and to, to accept appropriate treatment. And I think as Melissa was pointing out, there are um, for a subset of those patients. These forensically referred patients, they have some criminal, uh, criminal justice involvement prior to their admission. They have a serious psychiatric illness. And uh, if they lack competency or um, not sane at the time of their criminal offense, there is no legal mechanism to allow for a restoration of competence for them to potentially be held accountable or not accountable for their criminal behavior. And so what that then does is that even if we pursue treatment through the courts and they uh, get treated to a point of recovery, if it's a very serious criminal offense, then, then it becomes a legal issue. There are no mechanisms for resolving that criminal matter. And there, there are a small subset of individuals in that system of care who then kind of get stuck and clogged in that system. I think a larger proportion are the folks that don't have criminal justice involvement, they're just very ill, and as a result of their illness, they're not safe in the community, and getting them treated, I think, is an important issue. So whatever mechanisms that can be, um, can be done legislatively to streamline that. I spend a lot of my time training physicians from elsewhere who've practiced in different states, and I spend a lot of time talking about the idiosync idiosyncrasies of the Vermont uh, mental health legal system, and 
And they will often say, oh boy, we can treat somebody in three days if we have two psychiatrists agree that they need treatment. And so there's this huge spectrum. Vermont is at very one far end of that spectrum in terms of the proactive approach to treating psychiatric crises in, in gravely ill individuals. That being said, um, that's one issue about access. I think there's another important issue about access to high-level acute psychiatric bed capacity, and that's really on the other end when somebody has been successfully treated, they're at a stage of sufficient recovery, and then that transition back to the community. They may lack the resources, or they may have destroyed and squandered all their resources as a result of behavior associated with their illness, for instance. They may be homeless, they may have lost their jobs, and been estranged from loved ones, and their natural support systems in, in their community. And working with the designated agencies to try to find those resources I, can, be, um, can be really challenging because they are really at a limit in terms of what their capacity to take on new individuals. And, and so when we talk about a broader approach to increasing capacity, that's an important aspect to be considered is what about the step-down subacute level of care from hospital closer to community integration, maybe not independent living, um, the designated agencies do a wonderful job with the limited resources they have to, one, divert hospitalization through their crisis beds, and oftentimes they're incredibly collaborative in terms of helping us get individuals out of the hospital, closer to their home communities, reintegrated back into their, their community-based uh, outpatient care providers. But I think if we're thinking about how to utilize resources effectively and, and in, a, in a smart way, a targeted way, uh, enhancing the subacute um, capacity for transitional treatment out of hospital and closer to the communities. And I think that has a tremendous uh, uh, potential in terms of freeing up additional bed capacity at the highest and most acute level of care. Okay, Sam. Okay, I, I, uh, I have two um, not necessarily closely related uh, questions, but I think they're important and related to the panel discussion. Uh, yes, it's in a different venue, but um, what are you doing to preclude uh, the, the potential and very real overuse of psychotropic meds, particularly antipsychotic med meds, which, as you know, contribute to earlier than otherwise mortality, particularly if it's comorbid with dementia. But um, so that's number one, and two, under the social determinants of health. How are you dealing with employment implications uh, related to mental health and substance abuse? For example, the correlation of employment with uh, increased overall health and decreased uh, cost. Um, to, to answer your question about what are we doing to, to, to prevent um, the uh, excessive use of antipsychotic medications that increase the risk for metabolic side effects and premature death, particularly in elderly individuals and those with dementia, I would say we're not doing enough, frankly. Um, um, at our hospital, um, we have mechanisms in place to ensure that if anybody is using more than one antipsychotic, they have to clearly articulate a rationale for doing so. Um, so there are, I think, a number of systematic um, uh, solutions in place that I think have a great deal of potential. So flagging, reminders, our pharmacy is, is always actively interacting with our medical staff. Uh, particularly if we have um, contract physicians that are working in our hospital just to remind them of standards of care, remind them of their responsibility to be thoughtful and cautious about utilization of those medications. Um, regular metabolic screening um, for adverse effects um, is another important area uh, to, um, to really decrease those um, serious adverse um, side effects. Um, Educating individuals um, who are using medications, uh, really uh, providing informed consent. These medications can be potentially life-saving in many instances, and so really it's a risk-benefit risk analysis in terms of uh, uh, engaging in the discussion, educating our patients. Uh, I think physicians have a, a primary educational role in terms of uh, uh, giving individuals information about their healthcare choices and then assisting them in making uh, reasonable and rational decisions about how best to care for their health. Uh, in the event of individuals who, who lack decision-making capacity and require court-ordered processes, part of that process 
um, demands that the risks and benefits be clearly articulated as part of that legal process. And so it's part of the initial application for court-ordered medications that you clearly articulate the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. Unfortunately, for many individuals, there are no alternatives to antipsychotic medication. There are no effective alternatives. And so, you know, for those individuals that were, were really re requesting the highest and most intrusive level of psychiatric care, we do so with great caution and we do so with great deliberation. These are not things that any of us take lightly. Um, we, do not, we do not compromise individual autonomy and do so lightly without great pause. Um, we mentioned the, uh, some of the legal um, uh, requirements. I, I think judicial review is an incredibly important part of that process. Um, and to be able to uh, clearly articulate those risks, benefits, and alternatives within that framework, I think, is an important and necessary part of that. Um, but I think as a, as a clinician, as a physician, I think each and every one of us who who prescribes any medication, I think it's really incumbent upon us to be able to have those conversations to really provide, to really uh, acquire freely given and informed consent, clearly articulate and understand what those, those risks, benefits, and alternatives are, and then have a conversation and a discussion with uh, those in our care or other important uh, engaged members, family members, other support systems. Sam, I would, just, I would just add to that, I think that in the nursing homes uh, that I worked in uh, many years ago, if you look at the rates of the use of antipsychotics uh, 10 years ago compared to now, in Vermont, the rate has actually gone down dramatically. So there has been significant progress in reducing the reliance on uh, those types of psychiatric medications and all psychiatric medications. And I would disagree a little bit with Dr. McGee, only in the sense that um, Yes, there are absolutely needs uh, at times for psychiatric medications, but there are many non-pharmacological approaches that can assist uh, people who have severe dementia, even if they're not competent to make their own uh, decision, decisions about healthcare, uh, you know, providing special environments in the nursing homes, uh, other types of uh, staff or uh, community interventions that can come in, uh, sit with people, uh, work with uh, whatever photos or uh, environmental things or, or just uh, physical touch in some cases. There's a lot of non-pharmacological approaches that can reduce the emphasis on, on psychiatric medications in nursing homes, and I've seen it be quite effective. So that's an area to invest more as well. Excellent point, um, Rick, thank you. And yeah, I think all of us in the, in the Psychiatric Association, I think I'm much more aware over the last few years you know, of, you know, those reasons why we have to be, as Mark said, very, very cautious and, and really be on top of that prescribing. Um, the risks are not small of, of a lot of things. So, you know. Okay. designated agencies have been working on the open dialogue model, which is originated in Finland, where when people are in psychiatric crisis, how do you step and provide, bring family together, their, their social network together, and work with them verbally, socially, and help them through the crisis, and not turn to medications unless it's absolutely necessary. And a number of our agencies have been working on that. Sandy Steingard from the Howard Center has been training around the state. Um, so we're really excited about that. Plus there's Hill House down in the southeastern part of the state, which is really focusing for people with high intensive psychiatric needs who need residential support trying to provide that support with a minimal use of medication, if any at all. So we've been doing a lot of work across the state trying to find ways to minimize the use of medication, provide other supports. We also, our model of community mental health is about helping people be in the community and employment is a very important factor to help people get through mental health crises to address developmental disabilities and, dis and the challenges of that. So we have actually very high rates of helping people get employment and that's why we need kind of a broader approach to mental health than maybe some other parts of medical care and that's Medicaid funding has been very helpful in that it funds that as you know. So we're really actually very proud of the work we're doing in employment and see it as critical to help people get through their mental health conditions and, and have an active life. And in the substance abuse world as well, the Opioid Care Alliance in, Bur in Chittenden County um, has done a great job in, in working with employers to hire people in early recovery to get them working again and really support their recovery process. So there is there are efforts being done in the substance abuse world that are very significant in helping people you know enhance their recovery efforts through employment and training. So I hate to cut folks off, but I do want to stay with the agenda that we have planned and. Um, 
this is giving me ideas for future topics um, in future advisory meetings to perhaps even have a panel and open it up to the advisory. Um, I think it sounds like you guys are enjoying this discussion, but we do want to um, make sure that everyone can contribute in the uh, breakout session. So I'm going to have um, Marissa, you just stand and do you, anyone interested in um, participating in the workforce and education, you're going to uh, convene around Marissa. I think she's going to be up front. Um, Melissa Miles will be um, convening the group on capacity and need for beds. You're going to stand up, Melissa, just so people can see who you are. And then um, Michelle will be convening the group on access and quality. We're going to take the next, we went into our time a little bit, so the next 20 minutes um, to discuss, and then we'll ask um, one of the uh, participants to share out the results of your breakout session. Thank you, everyone, and thank you very much, panelists.